Hello, thank you for joining us. I'm Professor Mara Gubar from MIT. I'm from Funing. I'm from Wellesley College. And we are here to tell you about our research on Anne of Green Gables. Um, so this project began with a puzzle. Uh, I was rereading the Anne books after a long time away from them, and I was struck by how routinely Anne launches into enormously long monologues. So here, for example, she goes on for a solid two pages. This is the early chapter where Anne tells Marilla about her past history. Um, and these giant monologues raised several questions in my mind. First, why does Montgomery associate the heroine of her novel so strongly with a dramatic form of expression? And speaking of drama, why does it take so long for Anne to be turned into an actual drama? So as some of you know, there, was, there were film adaptations of Anne, one in 1919 and another in 1934, a talkie. Um, the first was a silent film. But as far as I can tell, Anne wasn't dramatized till 1937. Um, this is the cover of that dramatization by Alice Chadwick. Um, and that seems like a really long time to wait, 30 years um, before Anne was dramatized. And finally, what happens um, to the huge monologues in the novel when Anne does get dramatized? Because it occurred to me um, before I read the script that ironically, these monologues are inherently undramatic just because they go on for so long. They would not work well on stage. They're too long. And that made me think, what are they doing in a novel, right? Because um, it had never struck me as weird, but wasn't it kind of weird? And why didn't these long speeches make Anne seem narcissistic to me? That was a question I really had because when people go on and on, we tend to think, oh, they're so narcissistic. And Montgomery even includes two moments in the novel where Anne kisses her own reflection in a, in a mirror or glass and just like Narcissus. Um, and yet even so, I never perceived her um, as narcissistic. Um, so why not? Now, one way to solve this problem would be to say that Montgomery's participating in a phenomenon that critics refer to as the cult of the child, and we modern readers are just as susceptible to falling in love with sweet, good-hearted, adorably loquacious children as the Victorians and Edwardians were. So as you may know, Victorian novels are full of sweet little children who, whose charming speeches melt the hearts of even the crustiest and grouchiest and cynical of onlookers. So you can think of brave little tiny Tim in Charles Dickens's A Christmas Carol. Um, and it seems to me we have to, and right, his speeches sort of melt the heart of Scrooge and turn him from a miser into a generous and loving man, right? Um, and it seems to me we have to admit that Montgomery is participating in this tradition, right? Um, because Anne does win the hearts and melt the hearts of, of Matthew and Marilla, who are kind of gruff and quiet at first and then warm up. Um, she makes them happier and more loving and all this. But how problematic um, is Anne's cultiness? Because here is the thing. I would argue that the cult gets worse and worse as time goes on. So in the 19th century, oftentimes authors who produced artifacts in line with the cult of the child were very attuned with, to children's vulnerability to poverty and other social problems. And they were arguing for what we would now call social justice. So think of Dickens, right? Um, Charles is, um, his goal, Dickens' goal in A Christmas Carol with Tiny Tim is to make his society recognize and do something about the cruelly inhumane treatment of the poor. And so with Tiny Tim, he's showing us that poverty harms children. It literally disables them. Um, it's difficult and disabling not to have enough to eat and not to have access to medical care, et cetera. But over time, culty stories get sugarier and sugarier and less and less occupied with social justice. And so instead of being vulnerable to trauma and vulnerable to harm, many 20th century culty children um, are what I call Teflon kids. In other words, no matter what bad stuff happens to them, it just bounces off like water off a Teflon pot, right? They remain untouched, unharmed by even the worst abuse, neglect, poverty, the grimmest social circumstances. And I think of the 1920s and 30s as kind of the peak of Teflon kid time in the United States. And I regard little, Harold Gray's Little Orphan Annie, who made her appearance in the comics page of the newspaper in the 1920s, as a kind of iconic Teflon kid. 
Um, so what's so teflon -y about her is that she grows up unloved in this awful orphanage, right? Where she's brutally mistreated by this evil matron. Um, and yet, unlike Tiny Tim, little orphan Annie seems totally unharmed by this experience, right? She's angelic, she's loving, she's kind here, she's praying in the orphanage. Who taught her to pray, right? Um, so Teflon kids send the message that these poor kids don't really need that much help because they're fine, right? Annie's fine. Um, so poverty and income inequality and all those things must not be that bad, which was an important message during the Great Depression, right? This is something people wanted to believe. Um, so now where does Montgomery's Anne fall on this spectrum? And I would say in the middle, which is appropriate, right? Given her the time, the date of the novel, 1908. On the one hand, uh, Montgomery's Anne does seem vulnerable and like she needs adult support, care, and guidance, right? I think we worry that if Marilla doesn't adopt her, it is not going to go well for her, right? Um, she needs that guidance and help to survive. But on the other hand, like Little Orphan Annie, she does seem a little bit weirdly unmarked by her traumatic past. Or does she? So that was kind of the question that brought me back to the monologues. Could we read these monologues as signs of trauma? Um, that's what I want, that's the hypothesis we sort of set out to try and explore and argue for, that both the monologues and the moments when Anne kisses her own reflection could be read not as signs of narcissism, but moments when she relies on self-love as a kind of survival tactic because she's not getting enough love from other people. Um, so seeing yourself as lovable when no one else regards you that way could be regarded as a kind of quietly defiant act of radical self-care. So to test out this hypothesis, I thought it would be really cool to get some actual data about Anne's monologues and how much she talks and, and all those kinds of questions. And so I will now turn things over to Ming. So thanks, Professor Gubar. And let us continue our journey on our exploration of Anne's monologues from a completely different approach using algorithms. Next slide. So one thing that is, we notice in the novel is Anne is actually getting quieter and quieter as she grows up in the novel. And in chapter 31, which is nearing the end of the novel because there are 38 chapters in total, Anne actually admits, her, admits herself that I don't want to talk as much. And she said that because she grows up, she doesn't want to talk um, those lengthy speeches and she doesn't want to um, use those big words anymore. So we are very interested in um, exploring whether there is a downward trend of the length of Anne's speeches throughout the entire novel. And that leads us to our further research questions. But before we actually get to them, we realize that we need to distinguish between the two different types of monologues that Anne and other characters are making. And we define them as the pure and assisted monologues. So for the pure monologues, we define it as, next slide, a lengthy segment of speech by one character separated by quotes and uninterrupted by any narration. So um, it is important to note that it is strictly separated by a pair of opening and closing quotes, which means that if we have one paragraph with two monologues or two speeches that are closely related to each other, but they have one tiny bit of narration in between, then it, they will still be counted as two pure monologues instead of one. But what about assisted monologues? So it is defined as a lengthy speech by one character who occasionally is interrupted by the brief interjections of another speaker or narration. So unlike the pure monologues, assisted monologues is rather like a sequence of speech that are closely tied, each other, tied to each other and is um, all um, made by one character. And we also set the bar, set the upper limit of the interjection to be no longer than 200 words and three consecutive paragraphs in total to account for the potential errors of the shifting scenes or the dialogues that we might encounter. Next slide. So here's an example of an assisted monologue. It is from Anne of Windy Poplars, which is the fourth book of the Anne series, where Anne is having the conversation with this old lady named Miss Minerva Tom Gallen. And we can see that Miss Minerva is making those chunks and chunks of lengthy speeches with Anne only interjecting occasionally just to keep the conversation flow going. And what is in common about those two characters, Miss Minerva and Anne, is they both 
both have rather traumatic histories. Um, we can, um, so from Professor Gubar's remarks about Anne's history, we can see that he is an or she's an orphan with, um, with no one to love until she um, finally has a home in Marilla and Matthew. Uh, Matthews and Ms. Minerva is having a similar unfortunate life as well. So this can also serve as a great textual evidence to support our hypothesis of the potential correlation between one's traumatic experiences and the lengthy speeches that one makes. Next slide. So now let's talk about what we actually want to answer in a research question. We really want to know what are the longest peer and assisted monologues, who are the speakers, and where in the novel they're located. Next slide. So to acquire to start investigating, I acquired my I acquired the data from Project Gutenberg, which is an open source digital library, um, and. I went through the entire text using Python programming and filtered out all the peer monologues in the entire novel, um, by, separated by the pairs of opening and closing quotes. And among those, there are 190 peer monologues that are longer than 100 words. And we are focusing on those longer ones because we don't want the insignificant ones to impact our results. And then I went through all the data and manually labeled all the speeches to the correct speaker. So we discovered that Anne's speeches actually made up of more than three quarters of all the longer peer monologues, which is rather striking, proving that she is indeed the most talkative person in the entire novel. Next slide. So as noted before, we are really interested in finding whether there is a downward trend of the total length of end speeches of her pure monologues throughout the entire novel. And we really want to see if Anne is actually getting quieter or not using the data. But so what I did is I, for each chapter, I sum up the total length of the longer pure monologues made by Anne in that particular chapter. And I map out the result for the entire book chapter by chapter. And the result is rather a little bit disappointing for us because we were hoping, because there is no explicit down, downward line here. Rather, it is like a, a series of fluctuations with regional peaks and troughs. And so that it makes us realize that maybe we should take the contextual backgrounds more into consideration. So for instance, in chapter two, we can see that there are 2,394 words in total of Anne's longer peer monologues in that particular chapter, which is the longest in the entire book. And that is when Anne meets Matthew for the first time. And when she, when she realized that um, she could have a permanent home, or at least she thought she would have a permanent home, and she is very excited. She is imagining that she will soon acquire a sense of security and sense of belonging. Um, so that is when he find Matthew a very great listener so that she started to um, talk all about her imaginations and all her thoughts and all her life and all her um, crazy uh, imaginative ideas. Um, and in chapter five, it is also a critical chapter um, when Marilla asked Anne about her history, which is the first time ever that someone actually asked Anne about anything like that. So Anne actually, Anne grasped that opportunity to talk um, um, for a long time about her traumatic past. And um, this is also when we discovered the longest peer monologues throughout the entire novel. It has 843 words. And another important thing to note is um, after chapter 31, um, which is the chapter where Anne admits that she doesn't want to talk that much, uh, we observe that there is a significant decrease of the total length of words in those chapters. Um, um, so Anne is getting much quieter in those later stage. Uh, so this can um, be a great support for our hypothesis of Anne getting quieter. We also want to know that who monologues most through the entire novel. So using the same data, I group those by the characters instead of by chapters. So for each character, I sum up the total length of all the pure, longer pure monologues that the character makes throughout the entire novel and graphs it as follows. So there are seven characters who have made those longer pure monologues and among those, Anne is absolutely the champion. And she is, and she 
is making the speech as almost as seven times as Marilla's, who is who got the second place. And another important discovery is that those characters are all female. So we are the guys in a novel, and why are they so quiet? We read so many literature about uh, feminism and Anne books and similar books in that era, but it is still very illuminating to see the actual data that supports this, that supports those topics. And although we really hope to present the assisted monologues data as well for you, our approach proved to be rather flawed and results are rather unsatisfactory. So for our current algorithm, I am using a sliding windows approach, which is a very classic approach in computer science. It is iterative, it takes into account of the sequences of the monologues and um, identifies the assisted monologues um, from that. But it does have two significant problems. So first of all, it did not account for the shifts in scenes as we hoped it would. And um, it also included a lot of dialogues instead of assistant monologues. So that brings us to our future directions of our research projects. So um, of course, we want to keep exploring the new, more accurate algorithms to acquire those assisted monologues. And there are several possibilities to that. So we can incorporate the speech ratio between the speakers to filter out the dialogues. So a dialogues is when the two speakers, assuming there are two, um, when they're bouncing back and forth. So the speech ratio between the two speakers should be uh, similar, for example, one to one or one to two, something like that. But for assisted monologues, because it is um, it is strictly it is dominated by one particular speaker, the speech ratio should be uh, drastically different from that of the dialogues. And we also want to incorporate the speaker identification, which can um, possibly be applied um, using machine learning approach, and um, it can not only gather the assisted monologues more accurately, it can still um, bring a lot of different potentials to different research questions as well. And lastly, we want to use a dynamic programming approach to find different combinations of the assisted monologues. And of course, there is a lot of room to do comparative data analysis. We can compare the um, result in this AM book with uh, prior female orphan narratives such as Pollyanna and other, and we can compare this book to other AM books to see how Anne's growth um, has impacted her lens of speeches and her speech patterns, etc. And lastly, we can compare the book versus the play, which Professor Gubar will elaborate more upon. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so I went to the archive to find out more about this play. Um, I went to the New York Public Library for the Performing Arts at Lincoln Center. Um, and this, it, so I knew already from other scholars that Alice Chadwick was actually a man, Wilbur Braun. So I found this picture of him and I actually found a lot of pictures of him because it turns out he was an actor before he became a playwright. Um, and so you'll recall one of my questions was, why did almost 30 years go by before Anne was dramatized? And the archive was really pretty silent on this question. Um, there was almost nothing, like no info at all about the Chadwick Braun play. Um, there was, for example, no clippings file, which you usually find if there was a Broadway production or a, a professional production, which has reviews in it and stories and feature stories where you can learn more about, you know, why it was dramatized, nothing. Um, so the only thing I found, although this actually did turn out to be illuminating, was an article, a sort of profile of Braun. And, um, and it was um, it was revealed, <laughs> it's called A Merchant of Sweetness and Light because when he became a playwright, he actually became the kind of playwright who wrote plays for amateurs to perform. So like high school groups, other amateur groups, rather than professionals. And the profile is really funny because he keeps talking about how his plays have to be squeaky clean, like no drinking or drugs or anything in them because they're for high schoolers and stuff. Um, but throughout, he's like taking big drinks of alcohol and smoking a cigar and like all this stuff. So it's quite a funny profile. Um, my guess, therefore, is that the reason there's so little information on the dramatization of Anne from 1937 is because it wasn't created for a big professional Broadway production, 
but rather published as a script for amateurs to perform. Um, and one thing that sort of supported that is I went to the Harvard Theater Archive and the only thing I found there was a review of the Anne play. So I was like, yay, a review. But it was in a journal called the high school thespian. So it was reviewing it as a script for high schoolers, um, not a professional production. Um, so again, that leaves unanswered the question, why weren't professional dramatists more drawn to Anne? And I did manage to find something that spoke to this question in the archive, but from a very unexpected source. So I was disappointed there was so little on the play. So I thought, well, I'll look up the films and see if there's anything on them. Um, and I found in the process this. So this is a teacher's manual for the screen version of Anne of Green Gables. And that's, by the way, the 1934 talky version of Anne, not the silent film. Um, but ironically, the introduction to this teacher's manual complains um, that, the, that Anne is too talky, the novel. Um, so it says that although the dialogue of the film is faithful to the novel, when it came to the monologues, they just felt they had to cut. Because, quote, in one instance, Anne rambles on breathlessly for two pages without a stop. So, what this suggests to me is that Anne, Anne's monologues were perceived as a problem by dramatic adapters um, and film adapters, which maybe helps explain why they didn't want to dramatize it. And we can find more proof, too, for the stuff Funing was talking about, about how female-centered Anne was um, in the introduction to this manual. So it was written, actually, by the director of the film, Kenneth um, McGowan. Um, and he had just done a film version of Little Women. And he compares Anne to Little Women, the movies, and says it was actually easier to adapt Little Women. Um, and uh, because, he says, Little Women had more episodes of a dram of definitely dramatic nature. All that happens in Anne of Green Gables, the book, outside a wealth of vivid anecdotage, um, such as the insulting of Mrs. Barry and the fake confession with the brooch, was that Anne hit Gilbert with a slate because he insulted her red hair, and the two became scholastic rivals who never spoke and yet loved one another. Now this is one of the worst possible setups for a screenplay. A hero and heroine who deliberately stay apart for the bulk of the story? are not exactly the meat of drama. And I regret to say that scholastic rivalry is none too likely to appeal to the mass of theater goers. So here he's saying, you know, uh, basically he just doesn't think all these girls and women talking to each other and talking about and having their daily life, that stuff isn't exciting enough for, for, for films, according to him, right? Um, so it makes me appreciate even more how female-centric Anne of Green Gables is in terms of what it privileges, um, not heterosexual romance, as if that's the only thing that matters to women's lives, but like the stuff of daily life. Um, but it also, this quote also made me think about whether we could view Anne's re rejection of Gilbert for such a long time as itself kind of a sign of her traumatic past. It had not occurred to me, right, um, that maybe the reason a boy being mean sort of sets her off so much is because she's had really bad traumatic experiences with mean a mean man in the past. Remember the guy who crushes the furniture and gets drunk in the home that she lives in. So. I had never really thought of that. And I, I was sort of, this made me think about that. Um, the manual also includes, interestingly, a script for a radio adaptation of a scene from Anne, quote, suitable for classroom dramatization by children. So Anne is already being recognized here in 1934 as something young amateurs can perform, sort of paving the way for the Chadwick play. Um, and interestingly, this script, the script that we see for children to perform in the, in, in the, in the film teacher's manual, centers Anne and it lets her talk, it lets her monologue. So it begins where you might assume a dramatic adaptation would begin with, his, with Anne in the train station, right? Waiting for Matthew and their conversation. And you can see that's exactly where it begins. Anne speaks first, and then she is allowed to sort of have versions of her monologues, right? Where she does most of the talking, you can see. So then in contrast, when I actually sat down to read the Braun Chadwick play, I was shocked, partly because the monologues are so massively cut down, but more because of how ruthlessly Braun decenters and disses Anne. So what do I mean by that? 
he decenters her because the action of his play does not unfold from Anne, from an Anne-centered perspective, but rather from the viewpoints of adults who aren't even char made characters in the book. So for example, instead of starting the play in the train station, he starts the play in the orphanage. And it's all about the, the, the orphanage matron talking to another adult, um, basically about how much she hates Anne. <laughs> and that's what I mean about dissing. Um, so basically, there she's adults in this play are constantly complaining. What the monologues, Anne's monologues, get chopped down and replaced with adults complaining about how talky she is. Um, and the matron's name is Miss Minnie, um, and she really hates Anne. She says at one point, "If you don't get Anne Shirley out of here," she's talking to another adult. I'm going to have a complete nervous breakup. Um, and the whole thing feels really anti anti-Anne to me, um, and by extension, sort of anti-female and cultier, because when Anne does talk, she uses words wrong, she makes dumb mistakes, she seems sort of cuter and dumber than book Anne, um, and thus cultier, right? Um, and that sort of leads me to the final thing um, that I want to share with you, which is I always wondered just how close a link we, we could draw, right, between Montgomery's orphan Anne and little orphan Annie. Um, I couldn't really find any evidence there was much of one, but I actually think that this play could count as evidence because I could not get over how closely the structure of it and the tone echoes that of the 1977 musical Annie. Um, so we open in an orphanage, right, um, with the focus squarely on a child-hating matron in both of those uh, plays. Miss Minnie is a kind of prototype for Miss Hannigan. Um, and you may remember Miss Hannigan sings a whole song in which little girls, right, she talks about how much she hates little girls and she says, someday I'll land in the nut house with all the nuts and the squirrels, right? She hates little girls. Um, so I'm sort of moving toward the thesis that although Montgomery's Anne was initially kind of somewhere in the middle in terms of like uh, Teflon kid cultiness, she morphs over time, and this will not be a surprise to most Anne scholars, into a much sugarier and more sort of Teflon kitty um, figure in the films and the play, um, such that the play actually functions as a kind of missing link between Orphan Anne, Montgomery's Orphan Anne, and Little Orphan Annie. So that's kind of where we ended up. And thank you so much for letting us share our preliminary research with you. Um, and please do get, oh, I should, yeah, thank you. Please do get in touch with us if you have any questions, comments, criticism, things we should read, things we're not citing. We were kind of in the middle of our research when everything shut down and could not get access to a lot of scholarly stuff. Um, so don't feel shy about writing and saying we should know about your work if you are an Anne Scholar. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Okay.